Hello and welcome to today's Gateway to Global Aging Data Advanced Workshop. This is a joint webinar of the UK Data Service at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom and the Center for Economic and Social Research at the University of Southern California in the United States of America. My name is Beate Lichtwart and I will demonstrate how you locate and access data on aging via the UK Data Service in general and the data of the English Longitudinal Study of Aging ELSA in particular. I will then hand over to Dristen Phillips, Project Manager for the Gateway to Global Aging Data, who works for the Center of, for Economic and Social Research. In his talk, Dristen will briefly introduce the Gateway to Global Aging Data and give a detailed example of cross-country analysis using the harmonized ELSA and the harmonized health and retirement study data. Okay, let's start with how one goes about locating and accessing data on aging slash ELSA data via the UK Data Service. The roadmap for my talk will be as follows. First, I will give a brief overview of the UK Data Service. I will then talk about how to find, access and explore data and finally mention user support options and resources available. What is the UK Data Service? The UK Data Service is a comprehensive resource funded by the ESRC. It is a single point of access to a wide range of social science data. As well as the data, we also provide support, training and guidance. Please have a look at our recorded webinars at the URL provided on this slide. That is our website. Now, who is it for? It is for academic researchers and students. It is for government analysts, for charities and foundations, business consultants, independent research centers and think tanks. Our data sources are official agencies, that is mainly central government, like the ONS. Uh, the data come from international statistical time series, but also from individual academics who hold an ESRC research grant, for example. The data come from market research agencies, public records, historical sources, and we also have access to international data via links with other data archives worldwide. The types of data collections we hold are survey microdata, aggregate statistics, census data, and qualitative and mixed methods data. The kinds of data we hold are large-scale government-funded UK surveys, longitudinal surveys following individuals over time, international macro and micro data, census data, business data, and qualitative and mixed methods data. Today I'm focusing on longitudinal data. And out of this list of key longitudinal data, for example, I'm focusing on the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, or in short, ELSA. The English Longitudinal Study of Aging is a longitudinal survey of aging and quality of life among older people that explores the dynamic relationships between health and functioning, social networks and participation, and economic position as people plan for, move into, and progress beyond retirement. We hold so far seven waves from 1998 to 2015, and as we speak, wave eight is underway. It started in May 2016 and will be conducted until June 2017. The study number in our data catalog is SN, stands for study number 5050. So now, why is this so interesting? Well, one in three people in England are now over 50 which means it's really important to understand what life is like for England's aging population. And ELSA helps the government plan for healthcare services and pension systems to best meet the needs of this growing population. The main objectives of ELSA are to construct waves of accessible and well-documented panel data, to provide this data in a convenient and timely fashion to the scientific and policy research community, to describe health trajectories, disability and healthy life expectancy in a representative sample of the English population aged 50 and over, to examine the relationship between economic position and health, to investigate the determinants of economic position in older age, to describe the timing of retirement and post-retirement labor market activity, and finally to understand the relationships between social support, household structure, and the transfer of assets. 
The English Longitudinal Study of Aging collects data from a representative sample, and that's about 10,000. So it's more or less. It varies, and uh, people have to be response have to be added to the sample uh, on particular waves. But roughly about 10,000 of the population aged 50 plus in England, on a range of indicators such as health, economic circumstances, well-being, and social participation. One of the key findings of the most recent wave was, for example, that more people aged over the state pension age are now working than ever before. Over a third of 60 to 69-year-olds were either employed or self-employed in the last month. Now, that can be a good or a bad thing or both. It can be a bad thing because it might mean that receiving a pension is no longer sufficient, is no longer a sufficient income. However, it could be also a good thing as it means older people are fitter and are able to work longer. In any case, there might be a good aspect to that, which is a second finding, and that is that the majority of people over the age of 50 report hardly ever or never experiencing feelings of loneliness. In wave three, uh, people were also asked, thinking back over your life, with its wide variety of enjoyable as well as difficult experiences. Please write about three aspects of your life that have been especially important to you and how they affected you. That is part of the life history uh, interview in wave three and that comes as a particular uh, text file with your data. Now, how would you go about finding ELSA data in our catalog? You have uh, three options, basically. One is to use the key data search. Here you would um, click on Get Data, then on the left-hand side select Key Data, and you find a similar structure I've shown you in a previous slide. And uh, you would click on Longitudinal Studies and then scroll down the screen and you would find the uh, ELSA data. Another possible option is to use the Data Catalog Search, and you would then select the type and specify data collections and then also type uh, the title and you would find it. And the third option is to search by theme. Again, you would select get data and then on the left hand side data by theme. And you can see we have a, a couple of themes and one is aging. You would click on it and again there would be a table with relevant data sources, one of which would be the ELSA data. How would you access ELSA data? It is web access to ELSA data, and here's a URL, so you would just need to click on that and follow um, some instructions I'll give you in a minute. Just a word before that, it requires agreement to special conditions online. It's not a problem. I will also explain what this special condition is later on. And you can click on it online and it will not delay your download process. The data are supplied in SPSS, Data, SAS, and TAP, and RTF for the life history essays. So this is how you download the data and the documentation. It all comes as a zip bundle. In the data catalog, you find the study 5050 on that particular URL, I've given it here, and then uh, circled in red is what you need to click on, it's download order, and then you will be asked to register if you haven't registered with us before. You will need to provide a couple of details about yourself, your institution, and the project you, you intend to use the data for. And then in the process of that, you will also ask to accept the special conditions. You click on that, and then basically it shows you that little box um, summarizing the special conditions. And it's mainly to do with confidentiality. So you have to agree not to link or attempt to link the ELSA wave zero data to the health survey for England data because they are a sample actually taken uh, from the HSE. Not to, agree, uh, to agree not to use the wave zero data in any way to identify participants from ELSA or HSE. And uh, finally, to agree not to use nor attempt to use ELSA data to identify specific geography from which the study sample was selected, nor to claim to have done so. So you accept that, <clears throat> and then you choose which format you would like to, to download your data in SPSS data or else. If you uh, cannot remember um, that, you just go online and every step is outlined under Get Data and How to Access Data, and step by step you can follow what to do in order to access data. Now, exploring ELSA data online. We have uh, a Nesta 
browsing and analysis system available and it allows users to search for, locate, browse and analyze and download a wide variety of statistical data within a web browser. However, um, the ELSA data are too big and also you have to uh, accept special conditions but there is a teaching data set available and you can actually browse it so unless you want to do uh, cross tabulations and regressions you don't even need to register for that you can just go and browse the data and see frequencies but as I said if you want to do a cross tabulation or a regression then you will need to register again it's online it's straightforward and not problematic. So that is a screenshot from Nesta and here I have used the ELSA teaching data set to just give a very quick example what for example you could look at. The question here was um, on balance, I look back on my life with a sense of happiness and what did people answer to that? Do they look back with a sense of happiness or not? And it's actually quite a good result, about 95% of the ELSA respondents on balance look back on their lives with a sense of happiness. You can then also do graphs and all sorts of things and download this. And finally, I would like uh, to say something about our support and resources available online. We provide video tutorials and webinars. Also, this webinar will be available afterwards. We provide case studies. So you can get inspiration of how other researchers have used the data. We have guides. We have themes, as I showed, um, and also teaching data and other resources on teaching. And we have an, a help desk which answers individual uh, user questions. So this is where you would find the webinars under news and events. You would find the case studies under use data and data in use. And here you could also search for which uh, case studies do we hold uh, based on ELSA data. And teaching resources you find under use data, left hand side teaching with data and then whatever you need to um, choose from the drop down list. FAQs is quite a useful source of help, otherwise please get in, uh, in touch. These are our contact details and we are also um, on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. Now. If you have any questions, please type those into the box on the right hand side of the screen and I will answer your questions after Dristen has finished his presentation or depending on the time by email following today's webinar. Now I'm handing over to Dristen for his talk on the gateway to global aging data and on aspects of cross-country analysis on aging using the harmonized ELSA and the harmonized health and retirement study data. Okay. All right, thank you. So I think we'll just transfer over to my screen. All right, thank you. So one of the files that, uh, that you will download, one of the data sets that you'll download from the UK Data Archive as part of the ELSA data is the Harmonized ELSA. Uh, and this is a data set which is um, produced um, at my center here at the University of Southern California. Uh, so just briefly, um, the Harmonized ELSA was created to provide ELSA variables which are harmonized to be comparable to other international health and retirement surveys. Uh, there are health and retirement surveys which are designed to be um, comparable and how they ask their questions and who they ask their questions to all around uh, the world um, in every single continent. Um, and there's more than 30 countries uh, that have a kind of similar study. So the Harmonized ELSA currently incorporates the first six waves of ELSA. So starting in 2002, all the way through their wave uh, six, which is in 2012, we will be incorporating wave seven um, probably over the next couple months as that data was just released. Uh, the data set is structured in FAT format. Um, so in the original ELSA data that you would download, uh, you get kind of one data set for every wave. Uh, but the harmonized data, uh, the harmonized ELSA is just one data set. So every individual is one record. And then the different, uh, different wave uh, reports are listed out. Um, and we do that using um, <clears throat> a variable naming convention. Uh, variables are defined as similarly as possible to the RAND, HR, RAND HRS definition of a variable. 
And if you're not familiar, the RENHRS, which I'll be using in the example uh, today, uh, is a kind of a harmonized, cleaned version of the Health and Retirement Survey, uh, which is conducted here in the United States by the University of Michigan. Uh, and the RAND HRS is this version, uh, this very cleaned, user-friendly version of the HRS data that, you know, primarily something like 90% of the research that is done um, using the HRS uh, usually starts or also involves using this RAND HRS data. Um, and there's a couple hallmarks of the RAND HRS data, which we incorporate into all of our harmonized data sets. So one is that variable names use a really simple naming convention. So a variable like R1 work is whether the respondent is currently working in wave one. So R for respondent, one for wave one of ELSA. So this would be the 2002 wave, the baseline wave of ELSA, and whether the respondent is currently working. And variable names also indicate how similar to the range address version of the variable is. So for example, a variable in the harmonized also called R1 LBRFE is the labor force scale in ELSA. And uh, labor force and how labor force questions are asked are really specific to countries. So the scale that's used in ELSA is quite different in the HRS. In that, in that case, we don't give it exactly the same variable name but we give it this ELSA specific variable name by using the underscore E at the end of the variable name, which is to say that we still include that information because of course it's very important uh, to have labor force status uh, for ELSA, but it's not gonna be exactly comparable to the HRS data. We also include spouse versions of most variables. For example, a variable called S2 work is whether the respondent's spouse is currently working in wave two, these are really helpful if you're interested uh, in looking at family effects. Um, it saves uh, our researcher a lot of time of not kind of uh, doing spouse matching to look at things, um, which are quite similar to identify, for instance, households where um, both people are working, one person is working, um, or no people are currently working. And the harmonized ELSA, as well as all harmonized um, data sets, are accompanied by a code book, which includes a lot of documentation for exactly um, how these data sets uh, were created, how each variable was derived, uh, what are some differences that might have happened between different waves of ELSA, for instance, that could have changed the variable, and how is this variable perhaps different from the variable in the RAN HRS, which we kind of use as our basis for comparison. So we're going to do uh, just a really simple um, cross-country analysis using the harmonized ELSA data and the RAN HRS data. Uh, and this is just going to be a, a very quick way to you to see some of the advantages of using harmonized data, especially when comparing between different countries. Um, so we're going to ask this question. Are there gender differences in cognition? And are these differences consistent across all age groups? And then do we see the same pattern in England as we do in the U.S.? Um, and this is coming off uh, uh, some work that was done on the Chinese uh, Health and Retirement Survey, which is called Charles. Uh, so here are the steps we're going to do first. First, we want to identify relevant variables in the harmonized ELSA and the RAN HRS. We're going to create a pooled or some kind of called a stacked data set with variables and, and um, variables and observations from both harmonized data sets. We're going to have a, a few uh, prepared variables. We'll apply weights. And we'll analyze cognition across genders and ages for each country. And I'm going to be conducting um, uh, this webinar, and you'll see in Stata today, I've also provided you the program that we'll use as a handout. Uh, you can see in the handouts, uh, there's a handout called Advanced ELSA Webinar DOC. This is actually a Stata program. Uh, if you just remove the uh, the last C there on the um, file uh, file extension. Uh, you can follow along with me if you would like, but I'll also show everything on screen um, so you don't have to. Um, let me show you our website. So we've built uh, a website. This is the uh, Gateway to Global Aging Data. Uh, it's available at g2aging.org, and it's an overview of all the studies which are conducted around the world. Um, so you can see here uh, many of the studies and the countries they're uh, conducted in. And I'll briefly mention that we have this tab here, um, a, a download tab, uh, which also has links to all the survey data. 
uh, and how to obtain the harmonized data. So for instance, for ELSA, we direct you to the UK data service. For the HRS or the RAND HRS, we're going to direct you to the University of Michigan, which is where you would sign a very similar user agreement to get access to the um, RAND HRS data and the HRS, the original HRS data to download this. Uh, these studies are all part of a network and part of being part of that network means that uh, that you release all your survey data available for free for researchers around the world. So all of these data are free and available to anyone doing research. So first let's talk about um, cognition. So uh, cognition is kind of a, a multi-dimensional um, many parts of cognition. Uh, so we're going to be looking at a verbal memory part of cognition. Uh, and this is a test that was conducted both uh, in ELSA and in the HRS, and it's very comparable. And it's a word recall test, and there's two parts to it. Uh, so the respondent is given a set of 10 words. This is an example from ELSA. Um, not everyone gets the, the same word list, but this is a 10 word list. And uh, the interviewer says to the respondent, uh, I'm going to say 10 words for you, or a computer is going to read 10 words to you. And then I'm going to ask you to recall them back to me. So the computer uh, or the uh, interviewer says uh, the words are hotel, river, tree, skin, gold, market, paper, child, king, and book. I'm going to give you a certain amount of time. Can you read these back to me? Uh, so that's the first part of the test. The second part of the test is that at a later time in the survey, the interviewer is going to say, remember those 10 words that I gave you. How many of those can you recall back to me now? Uh, so we develop a score, which is a word recall score. Um, and it's possible that someone gets all 20 words right. This is very hard. I would certainly not be able to do this. Uh, this is in part of a long test. Uh, so the top score would be 20, meaning you remembered all 10 words, uh, both at, right after they were said to you and later in the survey. And the lowest score would be zero, meaning you couldn't recall any of the words immediately or lower in the survey. Uh, and this is a common kind of uh, verbal memory cognition test, which is used in a lot of these surveys because you really do see changes in different age groups in the ability to remember um, these words both immediately and delayed. So we want to identify relevant variables. First, we'll talk about the harmonized ELSA. <clears throat> so for this analysis, um, we're going to not be using necessarily the longitudinal aspects because um, this is just a quick analysis. Uh, but we're going to be kind of doing a cross um, a cross sectional analysis for just 2010, which is ELSA Wave Five. So we're going to need a measure of cognition. We're going to need something to identify gender because we're going to look if there's a gender difference. We need to identify age, so we'll need an age variable, and then we also want to weight the survey. Most of these surveys are conducted <clears throat> with complex survey design. Uh, and they sometimes include oversamples of um, smaller but important demographics. So it's really important to use um, analysis weights. So if you wanted to find these variables for yourself, um, I'll show you two ways to find them. Uh, and the first is at our website, um, the Gateway to Global Aging Data. So we've built kind of a survey concordance that allows you to find variables uh, between different surveys. So for instance, we know we're looking in the harmonized ELSA. Uh, and at this point, we can also say we're using the harmonized ELSA and the RAND HRS. We can select a year or sets of years, but we're looking at 2010 in both surveys. Uh, we're going to need um, some analysis weights, as I mentioned, because we want to produce population estimates. Um, we're going to use an age and interview variable, a gender variable. And then if we scroll down, you can see we have some here options for cognition. And I know that this total word recall score, you can see we have the immediate word recall score, delayed word recall score, but the total word re recall score is considered a summary score. Um, so we can search for that. And you can see that we get these variables here, both from the RAN HRS and the harmonized ELSA. Um, you can see we have a couple different weights here for the harmonized ELSA. You could click into any of these to find out more. So this is one way. The other way is the codebooks, and the codebooks have um, so much documentation. Um, let me pull up our... So this is the harmonized ELSA codebook here. 
Uh, and you can see it's structured into different sections. So we have a section on demographics, identifiers and weights, health, insurance, cognition, um, uh, <clears throat> throughout here. Uh, we also have a contents. Uh, so for instance, we could go into cognition. If we wanted to know more about our cognitive summary score, uh, and inside of cognition, we could go to summary score. You're gonna see this looks exactly like kind of the website. So you can see here is our total recall summary score. So for wave five of uh, ELSA, we're gonna be using this variable for the respondent, which is R5, TR20, our word recall summary score. You can find here information about how it was constructed, any cross wave differences. So if this, uh, if this kind of these questions change in different ways of ELSA, it's really important to mention that because these are longitudinal surveys. And then there's any differences with the RANHRS, and of course there were no differences here. All right, so now we know what variables uh, we're going to use here. And then we also want to identify the relevant variables for the RANHRS, uh, which we saw these using the concordant search on the gateway. Uh, but you can also uh, use the RANHRS has a great codebook, very similar to our codebook. Uh, that you could um, also search through to find these variables. One thing you'll note here is that we're using wave 10 of the HRS data for 2010 uh, because the HRS started in 1992, whereas ELSA started in 2002. So our variable names are gonna be a little different because if you remember, our variable naming convention uh, uses the wave, not the year. So this is one of the things we're gonna need to adjust for when we create a combined data set. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a pooled data set with variables from both harmonized data sets. Um, so here's an example of this data code. So the first thing we would do is we would use, and we're just gonna specify just these four variables, the variables we're gonna be using from the RANDHRS data. It's version O of the RANDHRS data. And then we're going to append, and, and what append does in this data is it places the, obser the observations from the appending data set uh, right below the current or using data set. Uh, so we're going to keep these variables. You'll see the other thing that we do here is we assign, we wanna know, we don't wanna mix up our observations. So we wanna know who are those observations which are coming from the RAND HRS, which represent the US, and which are those observations which come um, from ELSA, which represent England. So we're gonna use country codes here, um, and these are ISO country codes, and I make a variable here called country, and I assign 840, which is the country code for the uh, US. And uh, the country code for um, England is 826. So I'm gonna jump over to Stata uh, and I'll just show you this. And it, you, you'll have these commands uh, also for yourself. Um, so we have a couple questions here. Uh, someone asked, can we use uh, version P of the RANHRS? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, it would work absolutely fine. That was just released. Um, and the software that I'm using is Stata, uh, which is a statistical analysis package, uh, which is um, similar to SAS or SPSS. So you could do this in either of those packages. All right, so we've got our, um, our harmonized ELSA data in there. That's perfect. We're gonna add labels to identify our country identifiers. Um, so if we do that inside of Stata, uh, you could also tab that. You can see that um, we've got 37,000, a little more than 37,000 uh, observations from the US and 17,000, almost 18,000 from England. Uh, this of course represents the US study is a little larger and that the US study has been going on longer. So we currently have everyone uh, now who's ever been in either of these studies currently in it. We're not gonna use all these people, but it's fine for them to be loaded in this data right now. So we also need to adjust for differing wave numbers. So as I mentioned, uh, the variable names use wave numbers and we're gonna use year numbers instead. So we're gonna use our, cog we're gonna make a cognition variable and we're gonna call it R2010 cognition. <clears throat> so we're gonna say R2010 cognition is equal to R10 TR20 if our country uh, variable is equal to 840, meaning they're from the HRS data and represent the US. And we're gonna replace, <clears throat> replace that same variable with R5TR20 if our country code is equal to A26, meaning that these are people from ELSA and represent, um, represent England. 
we'll do the same thing with our weight variable. Uh, you can see that we have two different weights, and we'll talk a little bit about weighting um, really shortly. And then we're also going to do the same thing with our age variable. You notice we didn't have to adjust our gender variable. Uh, the gender variable was RA gender, and that's the same in both studies because it is not a wave-specific um, variable. It is considered a panel-specific variable, and that gender is something that doesn't change over time. So if we jump back into Stata, um, uh, we can make these changes. So we adjust, uh, we make our weight variable, our age variable, and our cognition variable. Sometimes it's helpful because we want to look over different age categories, if you remember uh, what we wanted to do here. So it's, sometimes it's quite helpful uh, to look at um, not age as a, as a continuous variable, but different age categories. So for this analysis, we're going to look at um, these age categories here. And these are uh, people who are 55 to 59, 60 through 64, 65 to 69, 70 through 74, 75 to 79, uh, and then 80 and over. So we're going to represent these age categories um, here as kind of a way to look at how, uh, how this cognitive summary score, this verbal cognitive summary score, might be changing over different age groups. And so I'm using this eGen function. If you're not familiar, it's just kind of um, an enhanced uh, variable generation um, function that allows you to do things like kind of cut a variable at the values. Uh, so we use that here. If we jump into Stata, we can do that. Uh, and you can see here that if we tab this variable, so now here are our categories. So you can see we've got uh, 55 and over, 60 and over, 65 and over, 70 and over, 75 and over, and 80 and over. So we've got our six age groups there. That looks perfect. You'll also notice there's a lot of people who don't fit this criteria. Um, <clears throat> you know, we have a missing value here for 28,000. Uh, and this is because both ELSA and HRS um, start from, uh, also start tracking people at 50, um, and the HRS starts at 51, but both also include non-respondent or spouses, which are not age eligible to be in the survey. So there's actually um, a handful of quite young people in the survey because they are married to someone who is age eligible, uh, <clears throat> which is really helpful if you wanna consider a family or a couple, you want both of those people's information. But in this case, for cognition, we're just looking at respondent level, so we don't need to worry about those extra people. And we really want to see how cognition declines after age 55. We wouldn't expect a lot of change between 50 and 55 necessarily. So we've got our age category generated. <clears throat> so now let's talk about weighting. Uh, we're going to do. Uh, we're going to be using the SV set command. Uh, this is one of the reasons this data is very helpful, is there's a lot of kind of built-in commands, particularly for people who are analyzing um, survey data and complex survey data. Um, so we can say SV set. We can set our weight. This is a, we're saying it's a probability weight here. That's what P weight means. And we're using the weight variable, which has both the values from the weight variable from um, the HRS and from ELSA. Uh, which you might say these weight variables are probably generated differently, and that's absolutely true, and we should take into account that. And we do that by setting our strata as our country variable. So we're saying these weight variables are really specific to the strata, and in this strata we have two different country variables. So if we jump back into this data, we can go through that, and we can find a little more information. So you can see here uh, that once we've set um, kind of our weighting, uh, we have two strata. You can see the number of observations um, in both of those. Uh, and you can see our country codes here, which is 826 and 840. Um, the nice thing about using SVOI set is once this is set, we can call a lot of commands quite quickly without having to uh, kind of redefine what is, the, uh, what is the weight and what is our strata. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to estimate mean cognition just for each country. So for everyone kind of in the group that we're looking at, so 55 and over, what's the mean cognition in both countries? So here we say SVY. Uh, we need to specify a subpopulation because again, we're not looking at everyone, just people 55 to um, 55 and over. I'm just using 110 here kind of as a, a max age. Um, 
and we're saying uh, the mean cognition of our cognition summary score, which we're calling uh, 2000 and R2010 cog, and we're saying over country. So if we jump back into this data, we can go through. You can see that for England, we would estimate um, for this age group of people who are 55 and over, we would estimate that people on average uh, would recall 10 words in England and uh, a little bit below 10 words um, in the US, 9.95 um, in the US. Uh, and we can also look at this graphically because sometimes um, that's a little easier. Uh, and the graphs will help as we add more groups here. Um, so for England, you can see it's a little bit higher and it does look like um, it might be statistically significant, um, a little bit higher. The ability to remember over 10 words and, and less than 10 words here. Um, but not a huge difference. And you can imagine there's lots of reasons why this difference might occur. So when a lot of people use um, these data sets for cross-country analysis, instead of just saying there's a difference between the England and the US, we'll often say, we'll often kind of use what is called a difference in difference approach. So to say something like, well, in the US we see um, a difference in genders, and this difference is different than the difference in genders that we see in the US. Uh, and it's a more interesting way because it doesn't require that we adjust for uh, different things that could happening, be happening in the U.S. and England um, in asking the same set of words. And the set of words are different in these two studies, for instance, so that could adjust also. But if we're able to see that, that men always do better in England and women always do better in the U.S., then, then that difference is more interesting because we're comparing just people in England versus people in the U.S. and how those patterns might be different. So let's do that. So we're going to estimate mean cognition for each gender and each country. Uh, so we still need to set our subpopulation here of 55 and over. And the only thing we have to change from our last command is that instead of this over uh, and our over option here, instead of just saying country, we're going to say country and RA gender. And what data knows to do there is to kind of cross tab uh, those two variables. And so we're going to get um, four estimates. Uh, one for males in England, one for females in England, one for males in the U.S., and one for females in the U.S. If we jump back into this data, we can do this. Uh, you can see our estimate here for uh, males in England is 9.95 words. It looks like it's quite higher for women here. Uh, it's 10.34 words. Uh, for males in the U.S., it's 9.4. So again, significantly below both men and women um, in England. Uh, and 10.33, meaning that females are actually quite high. It looks like um, they're really quite on par with females uh, in England. If we look at this graphically, uh, we can see uh, that this uh, looks pretty much exactly true. So um, as we read, so you do see a significant difference, it looks like, um, between men and women in both countries, but that difference seems much more pronounced in the U.S., and in particular, uh, females in England are remembering, uh, we're estimating to remember the same number of words as females in the U.S., but men are, are significantly lower, uh, U.S. men are significantly lower than both groups. Um, so this is quite interesting. And the last thing, of course, is now uh, this is a retirement and aging and longevity study, both of these. Uh, and so we want to look over age groups. And one of the nice things about um, this uh, verbal cognition summary score test is that it changes over age groups. So what if we use our age category variable um, and we can estimate uh, cognition by um, country, gender, age group. So we're getting even more categories here. Um, <clears throat> so then we can again just use our SVY command. So it recalls what we've already told us data about how our samples are designed and what the weight is. We're gonna estimate mean cognition. Uh, we don't have to include um, our subpopulation here, because in our over category, we've added our age category variable already. So that's there. So that's already taken care of. Uh, if someone's not in that age category variable, they're not going to get an estimate. And we can also test this difference. Um, as you'll see when we jump back into Stata, uh, you can test the difference. Uh, and this is going to be an adjusted wall test for the difference in these estimates to make sure they're statistically significant, as we've been seeing in our graphs. So back in Stata, uh, you can see we get 24 subpopulations, uh, which makes sense. Um, so they go from um, 55 to 59 males in England, 
um, all the way through our our 24th subpopulation, which is females uh, age over uh, age 80 and over in the U.S. Uh, we get a bunch of estimates, uh, and if we go through, we can test um, these subpopulations. So. First, if we test the significance of difference for our youngest age group in England, so this is the difference between um, men who are 55 to 59 and women who are 55 to 59, uh, we see there is a statistically significant difference, as we saw before. Uh, and then if we look at our oldest age group, um, or our youngest age group in the U.S., again, we, again, we, so this is the males and females in the same age group of 55 to 59 uh, in the U.S., we see a significant difference. Um, you will have noticed uh, from our estimates up here that this difference actually seems to be greater uh, than it is for uh, males and females in England at that age group. Uh, and this is one of the things that we saw in that graph that was kind of suggested on that graph before we talked, we looked at age. So let's look at our oldest age groups. So is there a significant difference in the oldest age groups uh, in England? Uh, so uh, English males uh, and females who are 80 and over versus each other. And it looks like there's not a significant difference. So we're seeing something happen kind of on a, on a gender perspective uh, where we're not seeing the same pattern acro uh, across all gender, all age groups. <clears throat> uh, and if we look for the U.S., for our difference for the oldest age groups in the U.S., we do see um, uh, this gender difference uh, still come out. So let's look at this graphically because it's a... Um, a little bit easier uh, to estimate, to look at graphically. Um, so here's our chart with all our kind of 24 uh, groups here. Uh, you can see they're grouped, um, <clears throat> uh, so the genders are beside each other. So you can see that, again, we do see this difference. We see a larger difference for our younger age groups between um, uh, male and female, both in the U.S. and England. It's larger in the U.S. And you can see one of the things that you notice, of course, with both graphs is that it declines over, um, over ages uh, in both countries. So that makes sense. Uh, but uh, of course, what, you know, the kind of interesting thing that we saw from our test there is that it looks like by our oldest age group in England, there is, there's not a statistically significant gender difference. They look exactly similar. And the gender difference in the U.S. Um, in cognition, it still looks just as strong as any other test. Um, the other thing that you might notice uh, is that it looks like the gradient uh, is somewhat different um, for what we're estimating the number of uh, average words that are recalled. So even though, um, uh, you know, females uh, in the U.S. and England in our youngest age groups start at roughly the same number of words recalled, um, you know, by our oldest age group in the U.S., uh, women are remembering, it looks like, you know, maybe around nine words um, but uh, it looks like they're remembering maybe, a, you know, I would say something like seven or six and a half words um, in England. So it seems like the gradient uh, uh, for England is, of course, much less, uh, much steeper, uh, which is really interesting. And this is really just the first part of this puzzle. Uh, and really one of the powerful things about using these data sets is, of course, this is not just um, a survey about cognition. Cognition is one part of this test. So what are the things that lead to cognition? So both of these surveys have questions about education. For instance, what is our childhood education? Uh, what was the education um, different? Uh, was it gendered differently for our oldest age group here between England and the U.S.? It's something you could easily look at. These are longitudinal surveys also, and we haven't really used that aspect here. But one of the things that you might want to think of is who's leaving the surveys? You know, who is not staying in this survey until their age 80 or over? And it could be that uh, that women of lower cognition are dropping out in the U.S. Uh, and that can be because of not follow-up or that can be uh, because of end of life. And these people could be staying in in England. And because these are longitudinal surveys, we could create what's called a balance sample. And we could follow people between, say, 2002 over the next, um, all, the way, uh, all the way to 2014. We could look over that age group between the U.S. and England and look at actual people who stay in these two surveys and compare um, how they are. That's a little bit longer analysis, but it's something you want to look at as we kind of get at these differences. Of course, there's also differences in employment. We know that how long people stay in employment <clears throat> often leads to cognition. You see a lot of cognitive declines often when people uh, go out of the workforce. There's employment variables in, um, in all of these, and, and they also have a uh, 
uh, a whole host of variables in both these surveys about how well people are integrated into um, their societies, how often do they see their friends, family, these communication networks, uh, having conversations either on phone or email that, that we also know can contribute to um, cognition, especially this verbal, verbal memory cognition. Um, so this was just a really quick analysis to kind of give you an idea of uh, some of the benefits of using harmonized data uh, to be able to really quickly, I mean, there's a lot of work that went into um, having these variables, which are so easy for you to get started with your research. Um, I will say uh, really briefly that the harmonized ELSA and the RAND-HRS do not contain every, every question which is asked in the ELSA and the HRS. They really focus on those variables, which are one, asked across multiple studies, so can be compared to each other, and two, are most often used for research. So as you saw in the code book, the code book for the harmonized ELSA is quite long. There's a lot of variables there, but it's not every variable in ELSA. But you can always merge in the, or the original ELSA data with the harmonized ELSA data if there's a specific variable that you wanna bring in that isn't already included in the um, harmonized ELSA data. If you have any questions um, about using um, our site, the Gateway to Global Aging Data, uh, getting access to different harmonized data sets, questions about what's available, there's a lot of resources. I would encourage you to check out our website uh, and just browse around. We also have the ability for you to generate some of your own graphs and tables um, from all of these studies. Um, you can always email us at help at g2aging.org. Uh, we have a whole team of people who work on this here um, at the University of Southern California, and we could field your questions. Uh, kind of the best person, we always try to get back within 24 hours.